You are watching With a Cup of Tea, the High Plains Book Awards edition, a production of This House of Books, an independent bookstore cooperative and tea shop in downtown Billings, Montana. Now here's our show. Welcome to This House of Books. Um, we have with us today, uh, Judith Sarah Gelt, a finalist for the High Plains uh, Book Fest Awards. And she has a, a terrific book called Reckless Steps Towards Sanity. And we're gonna talk to uh, talk about that book in a minute, but first of all, maybe Judith, you could tell us a little about yourself. You bet. Hi, I, um, thanks for having me. I um, grew up in Denver and um, I love Denver, by the way. I'm always doing plugs for Denver. Um, it is a wonderful place to grow up, really. And um, it offers so many opportunities that I have taken advantage of throughout. I um, became an educator early on, and I taught mostly middle school, eighth grade. And when I say that, people are amazed that I landed in eighth grade and made my career there. Um, spent over 30 years in eighth grade language arts. I went on after that to um, higher ed and I taught educational psychology there after I retired from middle school in order to support a writing education um, so that I could become a writer. But in eighth grade language arts, I, um, I did teach writing to eighth graders, which was a far different kind of writing really. And I love teaching and I missed it when I left the classroom. I thought it was a wonderful thing to do and teaching became a passion for me. That was wonderful for me. Okay. Well, then tell us about your book. It is about growing up in Denver in a family where my mother was eventually diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I was a teenager then. Um, I lived with my brother and my father and mother, and it was a huge, huge piece of blowing up the entire family, obviously. My father had a very difficult time with it. He had been quite a controlling person, and um, he became angry. And so the household was a, a very unhappy place. I eventually, at 16, I escaped it. I had to leave. I couldn't handle it. And I left um, physically. And so with no parenting and on my own, I, I faced some very dangerous situations. Um, I'm, I'm curious to know, you say you left the situation of your family. I'm, I'm wondering what that meant. Did you run away? Um, I, I did run away at one point. Um, it, I hitchhiked away from Denver. I stood on the highway and stuck out my thumb. And I ended up in Lubbock, Texas at one point. Um, and I, I came home from that one. <laughs> I, that was a temporary, um, never thought out or planned because of a fight with my father. And just, you know, teenage not thinking and just reacting out of pain, you know, just leaving. Um, and I, I found throughout this story that, and again, uh, telling a story like this and writing about your, your past when there's a lot of emotional baggage, if you will, um, the, the way it's told to me that I uh, agree with is it's not, it's not therapy but therapeutic to do this memoir writing. And I look back and I think, you know, I really had um, something about me made me consider things after the fact, even at that age. And, and when I did that, and I ended up in Lubbock, Texas, and I was very, very lucky about who picked me up and what, it, or there's a lot of circumstance in there that, that made me survive these things. And I was picked up by a, a guy who was at Texas Tech University. Um, he had no ill intent. He drove me. I was going to get out in Amarillo, and we went through Amarillo, and I went, no, I don't know if I want to get out here. And, you know, he figured out eventually that I had no idea what I was doing. So he took me to Texas, you know, to Lubbock, where he was going. And he was going back home. 
um, after being on break, and, and he dropped me off in downtown, and I was going to get a hotel maid job and try and, and work uh, for a place to live because I had nothing. I had, hadn't planned it, and I didn't even have change in my purse. So um, before he took off, he gave me his, his mom's phone number and said, call. He gave me a dime so I could use the phone. That's how I survived that. But I decided to go back because I decided I had looked for hotel jobs by just walking into these hotels as the sun was going down on, on the main street there and, and nobody hiring me. And I went, well, this isn't going to work. you know. So I realized I had to get a degree. I had to graduate from high school. That was my thing. If I don't graduate from high school, you know, will I even get a hotel maid job? That was my thing. And so I had these moments, you know, in the book that, that going back and writing it, I went, wow, I really did think sometimes, and, and it worked for me. I went back home, and I knew I, I had a couple years left, and I had to find a way to graduate. When your mother was diagnosed with uh, bipolar uh, illness, the, the fact is people really didn't know what it was. Uh, it was often confused with schizophrenia. They didn't have good treatments for it. Um, the, one of the most common treatments for mania today would be lithium, but uh, that was not approved by the FDA until 1970. Right. She was one of, my mother was one of the first people to receive lithium as a treatment. Um, and it was, it was so interesting. Well, one thing in the story has to do with her treatment. She, uh, I will say this, she disappeared into the hospital. It was called a, it was called a um, mental, it was a, a nervous breakdown when people would do, you know, it was a nervous breakdown when people became ill with something emotional or mental. And, and whatever happened, if, if you were a kid, um, in almost all cases I know of, um, children were not brought into the conversation. And people, parents would kind of disappear and um, that was one of the problems and one of the things as an educator that I take very seriously, um, that um, there's this scary thing that happens in families when there's no information coming to the children. So she disappeared into a hospital. And all my father could tell us was she had a nervous breakdown. Well, I'm, I'm curious about the title, Reckless Steps Toward Sanity. And I'm... I'm yeah. Where did that come from? I'm glad you asked that because it, instead of being written in chapters, it's written in steps. Because when I finally decided, and it wasn't, again, a conscious decision, when I finally went and took steps to leave the trauma and the dangerous part of being inside that family, which was quite destructive, um, I had to take steps. And they were reckless. And the, in the first chapter, is step one, and step one is um, acting out. I had never acted out at home. I was a very, you know, kind of compliant child. And then finally, when things got bad, the first step was I stole my mother's clothes and I wore them to school. And it was a very minor infraction, but um, in fact, it started a snowballing of incidents that ended up with a teacher assaulting me. And so each one of the steps that I took to leave and to get away and, and, and remove myself from the danger at home, sometimes what happened was they became reckless. Um, through not any real um, fault of my own, but I was recklessly stepping away. Um, I had no parenting to really help me do that or be there for me if something went wrong. And that was the issue, was doing these reckless things. And it, it ended up putting me in a relationship with a teacher um, and him taking advantage. I thought I was in a relationship of support and I needed that support. And in fact, he had other ideas. Mm -hmm. So wearing those clothes to school had given me another mindset of strength. Um, and it backfires. So those are the kinds of things. So it's it's done in steps instead of chapters. And each one of those is is a step that I'm taking that necessarily doesn't necessarily they end up being reckless. Yeah. 
Well, tell me about the audience for the book. Who would enjoy reading this? I think um, the people that, that it was written for and that I've gotten feedback from that have been happy they've read it are, are first of all, people who have an interest in mental illness um, and the true story aspect of it because they've lived it or have people that, that have a connection to mental illness. Um, they have either family members or friends. It's, it's touched so many people. So there's that population. I think um, there's the um, religious population of, of people, Jewish or otherwise, who are interested in this story of um, how, what happens to a family when there's religion and people choose, in the same family, choose different ways of approaching their religion. I I'm, I'm, think that's one of the most beautiful parts of the book is that whole idea of that reconciliation and that understanding that's reached in both those cases. Um, so there's that. And then there's Denver and, and the, this whole idea of growing up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s where, where that's the life, that's the setting, that's what you run up against um, in real life and what's going on in society, what's going on around you. Um, and that's, um, that's the reality is, is kind of fun sometimes. The, you know, the concert at, at Mile High um, with Three Dog Night, you know, the, I mean, it, it's, it is what it, it's just the reality, it's, it's fun. So it's a, it really is a, a, a story at many levels. It's a story of uh, survival at one level and of, and of hope and reconciliation. So, yes, perfect. Well, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. And um, we'll hope to see you around. This program has been produced by This House of Books in collaboration with the High Plains Book Awards. The Book Awards were established to recognize regional authors and literary work that examines life on the High Plains. Nominations will be accepted starting in January 2021 on the website highplainsbookawards.org.